Welcome to the V2G Fireside Chat, where today we're digging into the challenges and benefits of vehicle-to-grid technology. I'm Daniel Bogdanoff, a resident test geek here at Keysight, and today I'm joined by Kevin Cavell, a grid and energy solutions manager, and also by Andrew Chafala, a test solution architect who is one of the people writing V2G specs and standards. I'm excited you're both here. You're both experts in this space, so let's get into it. So Andrew, I was hoping you could set the scene for me. We have grid on one side, vehicle folks on the other side. Can you just give me an overview of that ecosystem as it exists today? Yeah, thanks, Daniel. So vehicle to grid really kind of serves as the the point of convergence between these these two historically disparate domains. So the utility industry has operated a certain way for decades and decades. And they're not really familiar with the utility people. Uh, when your only job is to keep the lights on, you become pretty risk averse. So when you introduce something new and complicated and complex like vehicle to grid, uh, it doesn't come without challenges in terms of trying to bridge those two entities. So uh, grid codes, uh, which are created by means of, of standards with a lot of different requirements and testing needs uh, to ensure that devices that actually generate power uh, or electricity to the grid, it's very complicated. There's there's a really stringent set of rules. It's, it's uh, managed by authorities who govern what's called interconnection. Interconnection has a really specific definition in the utility world. It means that you've met all the requirements necessary within a specific territory manager's grid code in order to act as a generator on that power grid. And a generator means you can put electricity into the grid. So if I'm you know, putting V to G aside, if I'm putting solar power on my roof and I want to feed electricity into the utility, then I am a generator. I need to submit an application to interconnect with that utility and become an asset to the grid operator. So cars represents a, or electric vehicles represent a really unique form of electricity generation because, you know, solar power, wind power, fuel cells, uh, whatever it may be, there, there are certain things that make vehicle to grid unique from those, which is one, uh, they're all permanently connected with the grid. They don't move around. And number two, they are an energy generator first versus electric vehicles being a uh, transportation device first and an energy, a potential ener energy generator second. So you need to prioritize the transportation uh, uh, objective of electric vehicles. Now, you alluded to how these domains are so different, and that's a real big challenge because cars have historically, or the automotive industry has historically been fairly self-regulated. They do self-certification. The society in the United States, the Society of Automotive Engineers, uh, is kind of the regula regulating body for the vehicle. And for certain forms, there are different forms of V to G. You can do AC V to G or DC V to G. And the difference being AC V to G is when it all depends on where this thing called a smart inverter, I'm going to talk like a utility person. Uh, so utilities look at a device called a smart inverter as the interconnection equipment. So that's the thing that has to meet all the interconnection requirements. It's the, it's the physical medium between that generating device and the power grid. So in V to G AC, that smart inverter, it lives inside the car. And so that's called the onboard charger. So we use this different terms to describe the same thing, depending on you know which side of the coin you're on. But for utility companies, they look at it and go, there's a smart inverter inside that car. It better meet my grid code requirements. And for V to G DC, it's a little bit easier because that's when you're connected to an offboard charging station, like a fast DC charger. Uh, and the converter or, or the smart converter lives inside of the charging station offboard of the electric vehicle. In either case, you really need to have a uh, handshaking throughout the whole process from car to charging station, from charging station to grid. 
and there needs to be handshaking at every point in between compatibility, interoperability end to end to be able to meet the utility company's requirements for interconnection to serve as a generator. So um, that would mean like if the inverter is inside of the vehicle for ACV to G, that vehicle and the converter inside of it needs to meet the interconnection requirements. It may be done, it may be regulated by the SAE though, which makes utility companies very uncomfortable because they've always required some third party to do the certification testing. So there's a nuance there. Um, you need to carry through the communications functions to deliver the services that utility companies need from you as a generator. So if a utility company needs some sort of you know, dispatchable energy storage, that's the real value that V2G provides because it enables more renewable energy integration. And obviously for, for automotive companies, uh, you can add more value uh, to consumers who own electric vehicles. But you need to be able to have an interface between the car and the charging station that can transport messages that help deliver the specific services required by utilities. And then on the other side of the charging station, there's another interface speaking utility language. And that is to carry out the functions for the services required by the grid. So uh, if the car and the charging station, when they're speaking to each other, if they can't complete a conversation that represents exactly what is needed by the utility or requested by the utility, um, then you can't complete the chain. And equally, if there's a message sent from really would be a charge network operator uh, or a charge point operator, depending on what lingo you're using. Um, if it sends a message that says, hey, I need energy storage, like we need to dispatch some uh, form of grid support, some sort of frequency regulation, voltage regulation to keep the grid operational. And then the charging station, it's supposed to translate that into automotive speak. And if it doesn't complete that translation where there's not an equivalent message on the other side of the charging station, you can't complete the chain. So you really got to have both sides of this intermediate device speaking different languages, but being translated so they're interpretable both back and forth. And that's how you accomplish VTG. So, so essentially what I'm hearing is you have a solution device in the middle, be it on the car or a separate device. And the grid will call this a smart inverter. The automotive people will call this an onboard charger. And it has to both literally translate power from the EV's battery in, back into the grid and also translate the languages between the two industries. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So uh, inside of... And, and regardless of where the communication piece that you just described for this protocol transformation, that holds true no matter where this smart inverter lives, because the car will always speak, you know, think of it as like uh, uh, two do different domains, two different planets crashing together, the life forms that live on the resulting planet, they have to speak to each other. But it just so happens the, the EV people, the charging station people, when they're talking to each other, they talk one language, and that language is different from what the utility people speak and what they require as they're talking with their assets out on the power grid. So you need some Rosetta Stone, you know, something in the middle that does the translation. And each of the protocols have to have the proper functions implemented. Because when a utility company says, hey, I need, I need you as a grid, as some generating asset, I need you to provide some form of grid support, grid services, help me regulate frequency, help me regulate voltage. Those are the big things. You know, if frequency and voltage get out of whack, then the utility company is going to shut the thing down and, and protect its, its uh, very expensive equipment. It's, it's a lot of power. Uh, right. So you have to test the protocol, the communication and the power together that for every action, there's a reaction. So for every message sent, there's some form of 
response that we need to be able to test and validate. Like, are you hearing what I say? And are you acting according to what was said? Because the power response is the, is the, uh, is the reaction. Piece. Well, I love a good first contact sci-fi story. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, right. This is a good example. <laughs> So Kevin, can you lay out for me kind of on a high level, what is V2G and what gets you excited about it? Yeah, Daniel, thanks. One thing for me, I guess one great thing that I, that I like about working for this company is I'm working in technologies that I'm interested in outside. Uh, and it also gives me a chance to easily explain what I do to my family <laughs> uh, instead of saying I work in computers. Um, so V2G for me, I don't, yet own an electric vehicle but i'm my next purchase will probably be either a plug-in hybrid or a full electric one of the things that gets me excited potentially about the going full electric is these v this v to g technology uh, because it's not only a benefit to the utilities as andrew explains it's a benefit to the consumer in a couple of different ways uh, one of them not necessarily v to g related but and that's vehicle to home, where if you've seen in the U.S., uh, the Ford F-150 Lightning, there was a commercial that I saw where it talks about running your home off of your car. That's exciting. Uh, it's a whole home generator, basically. So in storms here, I live in the Northeast. We often have storms. Uh, we get affected by hurricanes now and then. I need power. I have a young family. And uh, my wife and I might be able to freeze it out, but we want our kids to be warm. And plugging the car in and running the whole house off of that, running our heat, uh, air conditioning if it's in the summertime, that gets me excited. Um, for utilities, as Andrew mentioned, they really don't want to give up their control. But the reason that they're doing it is because it is also a huge benefit to them. They can take renewable energy that is only generated during the daytime like solar. My neighbor has solar panels. Uh, they may be generating and uh, the utility can't use the power at the moment. If I have my EV plugged in right next door, that energy might end up in my car and I can give that back to the utility later when they need it. And uh, this is something that Andrew would refer to as like a gr or the industry would refer to as a grid support function. You know, when it needs energy to balance the grid, uh, they can buy that energy from me and it would be a monetary benefit and things are still being figured out. But most likely you're going to be compensated not only for the energy, but the potential deterioration of the battery because I know that's a concern among consumers. But those are the things that kind of get me excited personally and as uh, someone who works in this industry. So there is a lot of policy and poli uh, policy and framework that needs to be developed to maximize the value of V to G for everyone. Cause it's gotta be worth it. You know, it's gotta be worth it for us as consumers. It's gotta be worth it for the utility company. It's very easy for the utility companies to envision how it could be used as a dispatchable energy storage device. Um, and there's great value that can be offered to consumers with the right frameworks and i love comparing it like to uber surge rates so because there are plenty of people who have solar on their roof and go this is stupid i don't get paid hardly anything at all for the electricity i send back to the grid well guess what the utility company doesn't need your electricity at the time you're producing it when you're away from home and all the lights are off in your house and no one's watching TV, you're not running the dishwasher, no one's washing clothes, whatever, your load as a, as a home, as a resident within a utility company's territory is very small. And you're probably representing the majority of their customers at that point in time. So unfortunately, that's the time where the sun is blasting and your solar power system is generating the most electricity. So the utility company will say, you know what? That electricity that you're generating and trying to send back to us, is actually a detriment to us right now. Because just like when there's not enough electricity 
supply to meet demand. We all know that's bad. That's very easy to, for, for everyone to interpret. But it's equally bad when there is too much electricity generation for the load at the, a certain point in time. So it, it, you get the opposite effect when there is not enough supply for the demand, the voltage and, and the frequency of the power grid can start to degrade. It can start to drop. And once it drops below a certain threshold, the utility company is going to essentially pull, cut the cord. They're going to remove uh, load to help sustain, keep the power grid operational. And I've heard utility uh, operators call this cutting off the fingers of your customers. You don't want to do it, but you got to keep the whole grid operational. You need to protect your maybe trillions of dollars of equipment that's been built over decades and decades and decades. So you go, you know what? We're going to have to cut off this distribution feeder, remove these homes. And most blackouts are, are planned. They're planned outages. They're utility companies that use a blackout, brownout, whatever you want to call it. And when the lights go off in your home, that's oftentimes uh, a utility company is removing you for a little moment in time because there is not enough electricity for everybody on the grid. Somebody has to experience a little bit of pain. It's going to be this group of people for a while. Um, when there is too much electricity generation, they need to curtail the amount of electricity being generated. If you ever drive by a wind farm and you go, that's crazy, it's so windy, these turbines are spinning. Why is that? Well, it could be because there's too much electricity being generated and not enough load to, uh, to take all that electricity. So. They have to stop the generation or reduce it somehow. And you can do that with, you know, for wind, for example, by changing the direction of the turbine uh, or yaw control or to uh, make it so it doesn't spin. And then you're not generating electricity. So um, anyway, I mentioned Uber surge rates. And if you can map the times of need of the utility company, to the availability of dispatchable energy, you can create immense value. Utility companies will pay a lot of money, a lot more money than you know weak feed-in tariff rates uh, to consumers if they can have more an or more optimized approach to using your electricity. And one example is like in California, they have uh, the Emergency Load Reduction Program (ELRP). Uh, which is a policy, a framework that has been put into place to compensate people very handsomely to minimize their load during times of grid congestion. And you'll get like $2 per kilowatt hour. And that's when they need more generation. So if you can align those moments on time with energy dispatch, energy arbitrage from uh, storage assets like batteries inside of a car, you can make, you can benefit monetarily uh, as a consumer, and the utility company would be happy to keep their grid up and running and, and more citizens serviceable or more customers serviceable in their territory. Now, you asked about how V2G works, uh, kind of a block diagram approach. Um, so, one, one thing uh, that maybe known or, or implied but it's like when andrew was talking about those wind turbines not spinning that's no good for anyone it's not good for the owner of the turbines it's not good for the energy grid either and it's not necessarily good for the consumer because all that energy could have been stored somewhere if you can store that energy somewhere it's more product right and supply and demand Consumers are going to get less expensive energy if those turbines were able to spin, even though it wasn't needed at the moment, put them into a vehicle, put them into a battery energy storage system, which basically that's a simple way of looking at V to G. It's a battery energy storage system on wheels. It's better for everyone. That utility that owns the turbine can make money. Uh, the consumer can save money. 
uh, and the consumers that are owning the V2G capable vehicles are making money too. So it's 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 best for everybody if we have a place for this energy to go when we make it. Yeah, it increases the utilization of these renewable resources, and we it's sometimes sometimes we kind of forget like why why is electric vehicles a thing. Like, why is solar a thing? And, you know, why are all these things happening? Uh, this is all spurred by climate change and carbon neutrality, net zero goals of various governments all over the world, ranging from, you know, late 2020s to uh, 2030 up to 2050. And this is, this is to, you know, help promote a more sustainable future. That's why all this is happening. So you need to optimize the ability of these resources to actually meet those carbon neutral goals. And that's what we're, that's what we're trying to do here and how V2G can serve as an asset for enabling that. So, so the stakes here are, are super duper high and there are political ramifications and global ramifications. One of the things that's interesting to me about V2G is I, I think a lot of people will initially lump it in with like another renewables technology, but it, it's not actually generating electricity. It's just storing and redistributing kind of those, you know, peaks and valleys. But one the, the interesting thing is the duck curve. Yeah, the head and the tail are are, are the morning uh, time when everybody's getting up and getting ready for work. And then the end is when uh, everyone's home and turning their appliances on and things like that. It's very well known in the industry that that energy demand curve and the goal is to flatten it, right? You want, if you could have the same energy demand the whole time of the day, utilities would love that. That's the ultimate pie in the sky goal. Right. Yeah. And, and grid support comes in a lot of different shapes and forms. Like, and this is representative of the grid codes that I feel the automotive industry our certain players and stakeholders in the automotive industry are working to understand better. Because like like Kevin was just alluding to, uh, there's this demand curve that you know you can you can provide uh, dispatchable energy storage to try and shift the peaks and valleys of a demand curve. But grid support is a lot broader in terms of uh, what needs to be done to be, to interconnect, you know, using that word again, to be an asset to the utility. The grid is not some perfect machine, you know, it's actually moving all the time. Voltage and frequency are going up and down and not just like a sinusoid. I mean, like the RMS voltage increasing sometimes it's decreasing sometimes and the frequency is changing. And this is all done based on the combination of of uh, sources and loads on the grid at that point in time. Um, but it's not a lot. It's important to know that those changes are very small when right. you look at them because even like a one hertz change in the frequency of the, of the system could cause major problems. So I know, Andrew, you mentioned it's changing, but it is, it's, there are small changes. Yeah. Yeah. So in Germany, in I think it was the early 2010s, uh, there was an, a phenomenon, a phenomena that was uh, noted called the, I think it was the 60.2 hertz problem. And Germany was at putting so much solar power on the grid and uh, just solar, solar, solar. And they noticed that they were generating so much electricity from solar that the frequency started to drift upward. And they went, oh no, you know, if this, it's like, that movie speed, you know, if the train goes over this speed, you know, we're all, we're all in trouble. If the frequency gets over this threshold, we're all in trouble. So we need to do something to combat this situation because typically or historically what has happened is as soon as you hit one of these thresholds, all these smart inverters of all different types, like for connecting solar to the grid, for wind, uh, battery energy storage systems. Now V to G, um, they would in the past just shut down. That was their job. That was following the grid code and the inverter would be programmed to observe this frequency and voltage 
and go, if it reaches this point, I stop, I turn off. And when there are a lot of solar inverters or battery energy storage systems or whatever, that are providing power into the grid and something happens that causes that deviation or in grid voltage or frequency, and they all disconnect. You can imagine the transient response. The grid is not going to like that. All of a sudden you lose all these things that were providing electricity. You, maybe you aren't going to have enough electricity after they all disconnect. So grid support functions were introduced to help combat some of these situations. So instead of just disconnecting the second, the frequency or the voltage gets a little out of whack. Instead, we should ride through these events and see if, is it something that's short term intermediate and let's just ride through it, stay operational. And then once it's finished, we don't have to try and boot back up again. You just continue operating as normal. Uh, or can you actually do something to counteract that behavior? Because inverters are just, they're power electronics. We know from like, if anybody's ever designed a PFC, you can control, the, you can optimize the power factor uh, on the output of an inverter uh, using the PFC stage, programming or you know, optimizing how it operates to have a nice, perfect sinusoid. Um, and you can use that same concept, similar concept to counteract, uh, the way the power grid is behaving. So if the voltage of the greater grid is moving up and a utility operator recognizes that, or even better, some machines like a, a network of a hundred thousand smart inverters connected to hundreds of megawatts of electricity recognize that in real time and go, ah, I can actually bring that voltage back down. And if there's some central controller that's talking to or managing all of these devices, uh, and they are programmed to be able to respond to that situation, they can work together to bring the voltage of the grid back into a tolerable range. So this is this is the voltage regulation grid service uh, that a network of assets like electric vehicles or, or other types of uh, uh, interconnected devices, grid interconnected devices, can work together to provide. It's like if you're trying to move a mountain, it's going to be really hard to do it with one person. Uh, if you get millions of people to push some seemingly immovable object together, you can actually move it if you get enough push behind it. That's the way you can control a network of electric vehicles, which represents the biggest conceivable energy storage asset in the world to the grid, because these batteries inside of cars are getting really big. Uh, and they can all work together to provide an immense amount of grid support. So you can use that to really keep the grid within its points of regulation. And this is what the grid codes are now prescribing as a requirement is if you're going to be a generator, you need to have these capabilities. And this is brand new to the automotive industry because they've never had to serve as one of these assets. Uh, other industries like the solar industry, they faced this, you know, some years ago and have kind of conquered this mountain. So they know what they need to do, but now you have this whole new domain with, that's cars first, but we also want to be a grid resource. Well, there are certain rules that you need to follow, grid codes, um, and grid codes are defined by the standards that uh, set the test requirements, the functional requirements, and uh, uh, there needs to be uh, you know, cohesion end to end, like I said before, the interoperability interfaces between the EV and the charging station, charging station and the car to carry out, or I mean, and the grid to carry out those functions. Uh, so you really need to test these, you know, this whole chain of events together, these chains of devices. So, together. so like a, a solar company from its inception, a solar company was designed to put power into the grid to, to have that interconnect. Right. But for EVs, that is not even the primary purpose of it. That's like a, 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 
almost surprise to me it's a surprise benefit but a benefit that comes from having thousands of pounds of batteries in people's houses or in garages or you know work right. parking lots whatever that might look like um, what what other sorts of challenges does the the industry face at large as as this as this adoption starts to come into play testing is a huge issue because interconnection testing with all these new functions and new communication protocols, uh, new capabilities for grid support has made the testing really difficult to manage. So in the United States, uh, one of the standards that gets utilized in, in grid codes around uh, the U S and in North America and Canada, um, and in Australia as well is this, uh, base standard called IEEE 1547, uh, IEEE 1547 and the test requirements, which, uh, I is called IEEE 1547.1. I'm going to spin up. I'm probably going to mention a lot of standards here. Um, it is, uh, it serves as the basis for obtaining certification required by utility companies to meet the red codes, which would be right now uh, for V2G DC, UL 1741 Supplement SB. So you use the test requirements in IEEE 1547.1 to complete the certification to UL 1741 Supplement SB. That whole certification test process can take three to five months. And you can imagine as, as companies that are like V to G stakeholders, EV, SE manufacturers, EV onboard charger, EV manufacturers, uh, time to market is so key. So waiting that long to get a certification is, is, you know, it's not satisfactory. So, but it's a really complicated, uh, I think there's been mentioned in UL that testing one smart inverter to these standards can produce seven terabytes of data. Somebody has to be an expert in interpreting this data and understanding, does it pass or fail? Does it do what it's supposed to? And that's just the analysis of the test results. You need to conduct the tests. Now for V to G, it gets even more complex. Because how do you initialize a charging station? How do you turn it on? You need to give it its brains. There needs to be a, a uh, client on the other end, you know, a recipient of, of messages and a sender up, uh, someone who's sending up messages. It's the car. So you need to emulate vehicles. You need to emulate charging stations. You need to emulate the grid and the uh, uh, interoperability communication is between all those devices. It's very complex. And then if you bring V to G A C into the mix, it gets complicated further because there aren't yet standards in place for V to G A C because there isn't a framework that exists for a generating a electricity generating asset that's moving all around because you might be uh, plugged in in uh, one state of the U S uh, like California. And then you go on a road trip and, or you go to a vacation home or whatever it is, and you plug in somewhere else. And there might be completely different utility company required for you to be an asset on that grid. So that's where the whole nuance of now a mobile energy storage system, like Kevin mentioned before, presents even further complexity. And the testing or the standards world isn't quite ready yet. UL, uh, and you know, we're involved in working groups and writing groups for a lot of these standards. UL 1741 Supplement SC is a new standard that's being made to test the charging station or the wall box because the smart inverter for VDGAC again remembers in the car. Uh, but there is a new standard, this UL 1741 SC, that'll be coming out for testing the charging station piece of that. Uh, but then there needs to be a corresponding harmonized standard that would be for the smart inverter inside the car. And that would be regulated by the Society of Automotive Engineers, which would require testing to, you, uh, to uh, SAEJ3072, which is harmonized with UL or with IEEE 
1547. However, that's just for the smart inverter functionality. There needs to be more testing for the interoperability interface, which will be a completely different standard for right now. It's gearing towards IEEE 2030.5 between the car and the charging station. Same protocol is used upstream, but we know from the Inflation Reduction Act in the United States uh, there and, and uh, the NEVI program, the National Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Program, which is providing billions of dollars in funding and incentives uh, to uh, deploy a fast DC charging network across the US. So we know that within those requirements, they've settled on a different standard, ISO 15118, as in the, the combined charging system, as the technology and the communication standards between the car and the charging station. So that would mean you have all these different standards that are coming together to create a, a giant testing animal. And, and that's a real big challenge uh, because how do utility companies know after it's all said and done, how do utility companies know that these foreign standards that they don't understand actually meet their needs. How do the car companies know that what they've done is going to allow them to interconnect and provide the, the value that they want to their consumers? You really have to bridge these domains, address it as a singular problem. It's just a much bigger problem. And so that's where as Keysight, you know, we, we have the breadth in Keysight and, and a broad solution portfolio that spans these two domains. And we envision that being stitched together as an end-to-end -end solution for enabling a much more uh, efficient and uh, uh, you know, faster approach to getting testing done for certification. And it's, it's not just um, you know getting certified, right? You can send your device into a place like UL or DECRA or TUV and uh, it could fail. And you are going to pay them for that testing, whether it fails or not. So you want to make sure that you test it enough before you send it in, before you get certified. And that's a huge, complex effort. You know, you have companies like UL that are doing this as a business, and it takes them a long time. It's extremely difficult for them to do. So you as a consumer, I'm sorry, not a consumer, but as a vendor going in there to get certified, it's a huge task. And, uh, you know, we at Keysight know this. Andrew sits on many of the standards boards, the writing committees, uh, so that we can get ahead of it and us ourselves come up with solutions that are going to help test this and test it quickly and test it efficiently. It's, a, it's an enormous task and uh, we understand it. And that's what we're trying to do is get out there and help. Because, like I said before, these are really exciting technologies. Uh, we want to see them come to fruition, you know, per, from a personal level and a, a business level. Um, and we know how difficult it is to to get this accomplished. That was one of the things that surprised me when I was at UL talking with their folks and, and with our, our teams as well. How in automotive, if they want to make a tweak, they kind of decide, is this significant enough to be recertified? Yeah, no, like, and it's quick. Whereas on the utility side, three to five months is just standard for any sort of change. And three to five months would be a project killer in the automotive world. So it's such an interesting disparity yeah. to watch these two different communities work this sort of problem out. I was going to say, and the fact that, that so much of this is software driven capability. So, you know, uh, it used to be when I was designing power supplies at HP, you know, you make a, make any type of little change, it's usually going to be something like hardware oriented, you know, and, uh, it's some firmware changes, but you know, you, you go in, you negotiate with the test house or, you know, the, the, the test, the nationally recognized test lab, and you, uh, uh, decide if, you know, there's going to be a change. It's going to be really long, a long span thing because you got to have redundant part redundancy and you need to have reference reference designs you need to qualify do qualification testing so much and then deploy it supply chain manufacturing so much of this is software so you can just provide an over-the-air update to add a new capability for grid support or you know we've tweaked our our voltage regulation function or whatever it is so uh how do you 
regulate that. It, like you said, Daniel, in the automotive industry, it's very, been very self-regulated and like self-determined if this is big enough for us to do retesting, how, what's the magnitude of such a change? Whereas in the utility industry, it's, it's very, there's a lot of oversight and, uh, you, there is a third party who the utility company entrusts to determine if that change is enough to warrant some requalification, some additional testing. And, uh, it's just so easy now to, to provide these software updates. And, uh, it's a, it's a real big challenge. And, and one other thing Kevin alluded to earlier too, is like, this is a car first. And so as all these standards have been written over time, the ones for charging have been focused on exactly that, getting electricity out of that grid and into that car. So a whole framework of standards was built around that objective. And then so precedents have been set. And then you want to add, wow, well, we want to do V to G and here's how we'll do it. And that whole precedent may not be compatible with the needs and expectations of the utility industry. So that's where there's, there can be a little bit of butting of heads. Uh, but you know, everybody is working together across these domains or a big group of people that are you know, driving these standards for to try and harmonize that's like that's a key piece the harmonization of the standards the ability to make this stuff testable and not so la laborious that you know we can't even get anything to market because the testing is just you know crazy to do and there aren't good solutions for it and there needs to be a po policy you know framework that enables this value to be realized by all the stakeholders, the car drivers, the EV owners, the utility companies, uh, everyone has to win. So it's, it's a, uh, it's in progress, you know, it's, it's a, but it's a really difficult nut to crack. It's early days and it's, it's very exciting. One thing I don't think you mentioned, obviously it's complex. You can tell by what Andrew has been talking about. It's super complex. But one thing we didn't talk about is from region to region, standards are different. Yeah. You know, here in the United States, we have uh, 208 three phase and 483 phase. Uh, in Europe, you have 400 volt three phase. You know, in Japan, it's different. In Asia, it's potentially different. And as a car manufacturer, you want to sell to all those regions. And adding this V to G capability makes you a distributed energy resource that needs now to comply with all those rules, all those tests. So it's not just, you know, here in the United States, uh, send it off the UL, get it checked and you're good to go. And even within regions, within countries, the rules and, and things are different. So it's hugely complex. That's what, you know, one of the benefits of, of working with Keysight is we're on top of all these things. We're looking at them and we agree they're super complex and we're figuring out ourselves how to help our customers get through these and get through them quickly. So when I look at the number of EVs that are potentially coming into the grid and doing this V to G thing, there are hundreds, thousands, maybe even millions of them at some point. And utilities are used to a dozen or maybe a hundred different power sources. How are utilities going to adapt to adjust to this quantity and, and just volume of, of devices and power coming back on the grid, what are they going to do? What's that going to look like? Yeah, so in this whole world of decentralization of energy production, we see a lot of regions kind of converging on what's called this aggregator model. And that's where there is uh, an, an intermediary, a middleman, for lack of a better word, that sits between a utility company and their energy management, their central energy management system. And, uh, all these little, you know, utility company would look them, look at them as like micro devices, little, little micro generators that really, you know, could be hundreds of kilowatts of megawatts or more, uh, tens of kilowatts. It doesn't really matter, but having somebody in the middle who is a, a, a software company essentially. Uh, that manages all these assets and ensures that 
They act on behalf of the utility company, carry out these services that and deliver services to the utility company uh, to add value. And uh, so this is traditionally called an aggregator. In vehicle to grid or in, you know, for vehicle to grid capable charging stations and EVs, uh, the aggregator is this charging network operator, charge point operator. And that charge point operator, CNO, CPO, uh, is, has been there using, uh, automotive specific communication protocols for, for several years now to carry out the function of charging the vehicle, managing its fleet, you know, of, of charging stations and cars and, and delivering services to add value to the consumer. And over time, this evolved to smart charging. So basically, well, we can control the car or the charging of the car, still getting electricity in the car, V1G, whatever you want to call it. Um, but we can like throttle it up, throttle it down to reduce grid congestion. But now if you're doing V to G again, remember you're interconnected, you're an asset to the utility company. You have to meet all the grid code requirements. If you're going to deliver those services, those grid support services as a charging network operator, you would need the protocol that you're using to communicate to all of your automotive devices to support the capabilities needed by the utility company. And so that protocol today is OCPP, the Open Charge Point Protocol. And OCPP is being updated to version 2.1 in 2024 to add these grid support capabilities, just like what you see in the grid codes and representative uh, uh, or carried out by other types of protocols. OCPP could be an additional protocol to carry out grid support. And you would really need that layer uh, to be able to connect the chain again. So it's like, do you want automotive manufacturers and or EBSE manufacturers, charging network operators, they don't want to implement a whole new protocol and maintain the old protocol, OCPP. They would rather build on OCPP, implement new capabilities using the protocol that they know, but the utility companies would need to accept this as a, a viable protocol. It would need to do all the things that they need that any of these other protocols do uh, for meeting the grid code requirements. So another situation where the automotive industry has to work with utilities to find harmonization between the standards and specs to make all this work together. Yep, exactly. Harmonization, creation of policy, uh, and, uh, you know, enabling this proliferation of technology through streamlined testing programs and interconnection processes, all this needs to happen to, to really help V2G reach a level of maturity where everyone can benefit from, you know, the value that it can provide. So like V2G is like the end sync of the automotive world or of the power world. You, you, you could look at it that way. Yes. That that's an interesting perspective, but I, I, no, I can't fight it. <laughs> I'll take that as a hard yes. Yeah. Um, one question that I have, and I've heard from other people is vehicle to grid, the, the act of discharging my battery into the grid or driving around is going to degrade the battery life of, and the, the longevity of my battery. How is V to G going to get implemented in a way that doesn't make consumers scared to hook up their car to the utility? Yeah. I'm, yeah. I think it could be simple. Um, you know, more battery cycles means less battery life. Uh, and one of the goals is to compensate, you know, okay. the, the user for that. But the surge rates, like to go back to the Andrews, you know, Uber surge rates, uh, this, you'd be, delivering that energy to the grid in situations that are surge situations. So you're going to get top dollar for the energy that you're producing. So it should, again, it's not done yet, but it should compensate you. Right. Okay. And, and if yeah. it doesn't, then it's not going to work, right? It's, yeah. it, it, there's no benefit to the consumer. So. Well, we have to understand too, like how, uh, cause we talked about this at like the V to G forum, like battery degradation. What, what are the things that consumers are the most worried about, you know? And like, well, what about the health of my battery? You know, we have to learn that. We have to learn, like, if you deploy grid support functions using an electric vehicle battery, which is going to have like, 
like Kevin said, all these charging cycles for using it as a car, but then these these other discharging charging cycles for grid support functions like the battery, you have to research and understand how the battery will degrade to better understand what type of compensation mechanisms make sense. You know, like do you have to compensate the consumer more by reducing their electricity bill or something, or does, mm -hmm. and this is the policy creation part. Do automotive companies, uh, work with, or utility companies, do they, uh, are they like owners of the battery inside your car and they, you know, maintain that, uh, or do they have an extended warranty that they offer or something like we're going to replace your battery every 10 years if you will and you stay yeah. in. and I so think like the sky, yeah the, the, the bottom line is it's not defined yet and it could be anything and if it's not something that the consumer benefits from then it's just not going to work so they have to come up with something that works you know i have a friend in japan he has a nissan leaf he uh just replaced the battery i think it Cost him translating into like eight thousand U.S. dollars. Um, say over the course of V to G usage, it depletes ten percent of your battery. So you'd have to compensate him more than eight hundred dollars for him to for that to be worth to, it to him. Those are the kinds of questions that need to get answered. Um, they're not answered yet, but they they got to get asked and answered. And um, I think they they're working on them. You know, Andrew, you know more than me. Yeah, I can really see I, the same guy that meant had the cutting the fingers off comment at uh, actually at Distributech, a guy from PJM uh, out in your neck of the woods, Kevin, a utility operator. He said, uh, yeah, okay, so, you know, you're worried about the battery in your car. What if I told you I'd pay for the battery in your car? And said, now, I, there's nothing in place for me to be able to do that, but that's the type of value we're talking about here. Like, what... What would it take to reassure you as as customers, as EV owners, to to pony up for this, to opt in? We need you to opt in. There needs to be a, a socioeconomic support structure around this. Uh, you almost yeah. like I got to hit my V to G credit so that I can get my battery replacement in ten years. Like, <laughs> yeah. right. got to hit my quotas. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, the battery degradation piece is it's really interesting. It's another. It's one of Another one of the research elements of E to G and because there's a sure, certainly a technical part to it, but there's also a, 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 there needs to, you need to understand the technic, the impact at the technical level to be able to drive uh, social acceptance through policy and framework. So as we're running out of time, are there any final thoughts or messages or things you think folks in this industry need to take to heart or think about maybe any surprises and let's uh, start with you kevin well i think we covered the test as a challenge um in depth so i won't go there i think just maybe an interesting point a lot of times we get asked where are we going to see this first and um andrew and i have had many conversations about this and and he's the one that actually told me about this but i'm going to take credit for it is uh, electric buses as a huge place where this is going to be seen first. Um, so we're going to see it in industry before we're going to see it in our own garages. And that's because they're a unique situation where, you know, in the summertime when air conditioning is high, in high demand, those buses most likely are sitting in a parking lot somewhere. And if we can plug them in, their enormous batteries can be used to help sustain the grid in these hard summer times. So I thought that was one thing that struck me as really, really interesting. So it'll get there first, and then hopefully we see it in our garages, particularly my garage, uh, sometime <laughs> soon. Awesome. And Andrew, how about you? I think it's really important for these historically different domains and stakeholders to work together because this is a harmonization is such a key word here and it really takes everybody kind of putting down their swords and going okay how do we actually make this work like it, because in like i keep describing this chain uh 
and these protocol transformations to deliver these services and deliver this value, uh, you, you can't be, it's really difficult to be an expert in both domains. Uh, so we need to try to work together that can be done through standards, through, uh, more complete test solutions to help bring product to market faster and help bring V to G, uh, to the public faster. And, uh, uh, we need to also reach across regions because like Kevin said earlier, this is very regional, regionally dependent. Um, different regions have different governments with different net zero emission goals and timelines and different policies for V to G prolifer or electric vehicle proliferation and renewable energy integration. And, uh, uh, I thought it was really good on like the open charge Alliance, you know, had reached out to the California energy commission to go, Hey, you know, what, how are things working in the United States? So we can make sure like the protocols that we're developing can be conducive to being used globally, uh, for delivering services like V to G because if everybody works in a vacuum and creates their own little variation of the standards or, you know, has their own way of doing things, it's going to drive the cost up. It's going to drive efficiency down. It's going to make testing more complicated. It's, it's going to make standardization more difficult, policy development more difficult. So harmonizing, I think, you know, uh, kind of reprogramming ourselves as, uh, and our minds to, see these two industries as merging together and how to make them coexist and how to help them interoperate. I think that's really, really key for moving this forward. Yeah. And to go back to the fact that this is really complex, I think I mentioned it a little bit before, but you know, this is where we as Keysight are really diving in. Um, Andrew again, sits on the standards committees. So we're getting early information and we're here to help you. We know it's overwhelming. It overwhelms us, but we're, Again, getting the information early, we're breaking it down. We're looking at the solutions that we have. Uh, we're creating new solutions, and it's our job to make you successful as a customer, uh, the, the companies that are in this business. So if you have any questions, uh, reach out to us. Uh, you know, Come to our website where there's a lot of resources there, or you, know, you have Andrew's name and my name, and you could reach out to us directly if, you, if you'd like. We'd have the we'd be happy to answer your questions. Well, Kevin, Andrew, that's a great way to wrap up today. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Daniel. It's fun. Appreciate it, Daniel. Thanks a lot. And thank you all for joining. If you want to learn more about V2G and the space overall, go check out our EV Lab Tour series. I went inside UL Solutions Test Lab where they were in the middle of testing a 350 kilowatt EV charging system. And coming up in March, we have a second lab tour where we'll be focused more on the vehicle side of the charging ecosystem. You can sign up for that now using the link on this page or in chat or just by searching Keysight EV Lab Tour. I'm Daniel Bogdanov. Thanks again for joining and I'll see you in the lab tour.